Good morning, guys. Welcome back to Sunday Youth Bible Study. So glad that you are here tuning in this morning, this afternoon, this evening, whenever it is that you are tuning in. Um, I'm glad that you have. We're going to be studying in Joshua chapter 3 today, and we're going to read this magnificent recount of when God leads the Israelites into the promised land. They're going to cross the Jordan. They're finally going to take uh, that final step from the wilderness into the promised land like they've waited so long to do. Um, the first generation, they couldn't do it. Not that they couldn't do it, they wouldn't do it. So often the case with sin and disobedience, it's not that you uh, can't, it's that you won't. Those two kind of go hand in hand, don't they? But they're finally going to take that step. They're going to go across the Jordan into the promised land. Joshua is now the leader. So uh, Moses has died and God has anointed Joshua. He has raised him up to be the next leader. And he is going to show the people that Joshua is with God, that God is with Joshua the way he was with Moses, that God is still with this people, that he is still their God. And he is still going to take care of them. He's still going to fight for them. And so today we're going to see another amazing, miraculous thing, like when he parted the Red Sea. You know, one of those big, big things to show that God is with his people. <clears throat> They're going to cross the Jordan. When you're going over this, when you're reading over these, uh, all scripture, when you're reading over all scripture, um, today, it just stands out to me. Make sure that you pay attention, um, to, to language. Make sure that you really are focused and paying attention to the tense of a word. Is it past tense? Is it future tense? Is it present tense? Make sure you're looking at the little things instead of glossing over it, you know, like, I've said many times, it's not a book that you just read like any other book. Anytime that you're reading the Word of God, it is the Word of God. It's not something that you're just reading. This is something that you have to study. You're taking in each word. You're thinking about things like, you know, the fact that we're going we're gonna to see that the uh, Israelites had to set foot in the river before God was going to part the waters. That's significant. So make sure you're paying very close attention for the significance of little things that you might gloss over otherwise. So when you pause me to read over these things, look for the significant things. Look for significant bridge words for, then, stuff like that. I could only think of two. How pathetic. But Look for those significant things, because they mean a lot. You know, God's words are not wasted. We, we waste a lot of words when we talk to each other. We waste a lot of words when we write things. We screw up when we do our tenses. We, we don't, you know, we don't have the integrity to make every single word that comes out of our mouths prime utmost value but God does every word that he's ever spoken is important and is valuable and it's got significance so I've gone on about that enough <clears throat> pay attention to those things it's super super important and it really really will help it'll help you to dig into God's word so together let's read over Joshua chapter 3, verses 5 through 8, and get our story started here. Then Joshua said to the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. And Joshua said to the priests, Take up the ark of the covenant and pass on before the people. So they took up the ark of the covenant and went on before the people. The Lord said to Joshua, Today I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that I, as I was with Moses, so I will also be with you. 
And as for you, command the priests who bear the Ark of the Covenant, when you come to the brink of the waters of the Jordan, you shall stand still in the Jordan. <clears throat> All right. So there we have the beginning. <clears throat> so as we're, as we're thinking about this, what's the first thing that you notice? What's the first thing that pops out at you when you're reading that? You know, verse 5, then Joshua said to the people, you see anything significant there? Consecrate yourselves, right? Consecrate yourselves. It's the day before they're going to go into the promised land. Something big is going to happen. And Joshua tells the people to consecrate themselves. Sanctify yourselves. You know what that means? It means to set yourself apart. Now, they're not saving themselves. You know, clearly we know that when God does a saving work in us, he has set us apart. When he puts the Holy Spirit in you, he has set you apart to make you holy. And for the rest of your life, he will sanctify you and continue to cause you to be conformed to the image of his son. So what does he mean? Consecrate yourselves before going across the river, before stepping into the river. <clears throat> well, the most helpful thing for me is to think back on Ryan's song. He's really going to like that I mention him. Anyways, um, that song that we sing in church, I've been saving all my energy just to stand before you worshiping now. That is a way to consecrate yourself, to set yourself apart for God. You're not doing a saving work in yourself. That's not possible. You cannot do a saving work in yourself. I hope you know that. Only God can do a saving work in your heart. But what are you doing to make yourself ready to hear from God? What are you doing to make yourself ready to be with God? What are you doing to make yourself ready to witness the wonders of God. What are you doing to make yourself ready to receive from God? Are you saving your energy? Are you doing things to make yourself ready to be worshiping God? This might be helpful. Consecrate yourselves. Or you can have an attitude of irreverence towards God. You can have an attitude of flippancy towards spiritual discipline. Does that make sense? Irreverence and flippancy towards, towards God, towards discipline, towards spiritual growth. Those things are going to be the opposite of consecrating yourself, setting yourself aside for God. <laughs> So the Israelites were called to consecrate themselves because the next day, something big was happening. <laughs> God is going to work wonders among you tomorrow. That's what he says. And then we go on and we see that uh, they're going to take the ark, they're going to put it in the water, and they're going to wait. And then, then God goes on to tell Joshua that today he's going to exalt him in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that just as he was with Moses, he is with Joshua that they may know that Joshua is the new appointed leader, that God is with him. Joshua is the appointed servant to lead them into the land of promise. Like a conquering king who will defeat God's enemies and bring God's people into 
their inheritance. He points us to Jesus. Joshua points us to Jesus. God uses him in this way. Joshua is leading his people into the land of promise across the Jordan. He's exalting him in the sight of people so that they will know to look to Joshua. You know, from Jesus' birth to his ascension, God exalted him in the sight of all so that we would know that he is God's chosen leader for his people. Let's read over Joshua chapter 3, verses 9 through 17. 9 through 17. <clears throat> and Joshua said to the people of Israel, Come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. And Joshua said, Here is how you shall know that the living God is among you, and that he will without fail drive out from before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, and the Amorites, and the Jebusites. Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth is passing over you, before you into the Jordan. Now, therefore, take twelve men from the tribes of Israel, from each tribe a man. And when the soles of the feet of the priests bearing the ark of the Lord of all the earth shall rest in the waters of the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off from flowing, and the waters coming down from above shall stand in one heap. So when the people set out from their tents to pass over the Jordan with the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people. And as soon as those bearing the Ark had come as far as the Jordan, and the feet of the priest bearing the Ark were dipped in the brink of the water, now the Jordan overflows all its banks throughout the time of harvest. The waters coming down from above stood and rose up in a heap very far away at Adam, the city that is beside Zarethan. And those flowing down towards the Sea of Araba, the Salt Sea, were completely cut off. And the people passed over opposite Jericho. Now the priests, bearing the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, stood firmly on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan. And all Israel was passing over on dry ground until all the nation finished passing over the Jordan. <clears throat> God will go before us to accomplish his mission. God will go before us. We need to be obedient. There's just so many key things in there. The priests, their feet had to get in the waters. And God makes a point to tell us another significant thing, right? That during harvest time, the, oh, the Jordan overflows all its banks throughout the time of harvest. I remember Lynn preaching on this. And... Um, he gave us all kinds of really, really great information. He did a lot of study on what it meant that the Jordan was overflowing at its banks. It meant, in a nutshell, uh, it was several years ago, but it was super dangerous. The rivers were overflowing. I mean, it, was, it wasn't just like crossing the Platte. <laughs> Not at all. Um, you know, this was some dangerous stuff. It's a deep river. The currents were violent and rushing it's not something that you would think oh yeah sure we can run across this river you know <laughs> stepping into those waters would be scary enough just on the banks for sure <clears throat> they had to have their feet in the water and that is when god said that he would stop them from flowing you don't always get to see the result, you don't always get to see exactly what God is going to do before 
you step into what he has called you to step into. You don't have to have the solution before you walk in obedience to God. If you know what he's telling you to do, if you know what he has commanded, if you know what he is calling you to do, then all you need to worry about is stepping forward when he has told you to step forward. Anything else is disobedience, it's distrust, and it's unbelief. And you don't want to be caught in that. God has proved time and time again that he's with his people. He will be with you in the same way if you are born again. And then, when they did that, when they were obedient and they stood in the water like that, so much different than the first generation, right? These guys are walking in obedience. They're doing exactly what God is telling them to do. And God does not fail. God does not fail. Can you see that they must be absolutely satisfied in God at this point? It was terrifying for them to step into the water. Yeah, I'm sure it was. And they did it. And then God is there. He does what he said he was going to do. Can you imagine how they felt seeing those waters raise up next to them? Crazy. It was a big thing. The whole nation got to see this. Obviously, because they all passed through it. But I mean, it was a really big event that happened. Now, the priests holding the ark, representing the presence of God being with them, stood firmly in the middle of the water. They didn't think, let's get out of here before the water comes back down. They did not waver in their commitment to trusting God. They didn't waver in their commitment to obedience. They stood firmly there, holding the ark in the middle of the river with millions of gallons of water above them <laughs> until the nation had passed through and then they would follow. <clears throat> you know, as soon as as soon as the ark was in there, and it's it's as if you know, God was proving that He was with them. The water stopped, as if God was personally putting His hand in the river as they did that, leading them into the promised land. They knew that God's presence was with them as they moved forward. We might think that God's presence isn't with us like it was with the Israelites back then. But that's not true. In fact, with the born-again believer, with the true believer, with somebody who truly is following God, God's presence is with us just as much, if not more. He poured out His Holy Spirit on us. Okay? At the day of Pentecost, He poured out His Holy Spirit onto His people. He has given us his own spirit. Now the born-again believer gets the indwelling Holy Spirit. God is always with us. <laughs> now he changes us from the inside out. The miraculous work, we're not going to see Jordan's split, um, literally. Uh, we will see you know, figurative strongholds, but the, 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 the things that God accomplishes, the miracles that he does are in the inside of you and me now. The strongholds that are taken down are strongholds of our heart, strongholds of sin that are conquered. The giants that are defeated are, are giants of sin and struggle that we're going to come across. These are things that the Holy Spirit sanctifying us, growing us up, causing us to conform to the image of Christ, causes us to come through.
<clears throat> so let's read over chapter 4, 1 through 7. We're going to look at how we are called to remember the great things that God has done. When all the nation had finished passing over the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Take twelve men from the people, each from, from each tribe a man, and command them, saying, Take twelve stones from here, out of the midst of the Jordan, and from the very place where the priest's feet stood firmly, and bring them over with you, and lay them down in the place where you lodge tonight. Then Joshua called the twelve men from the people of Israel, whom he had appointed, a man from each tribe, and Joshua said to them, Pass on before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan, and take up each of you a stone upon his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the people of Israel, This, that this may be a sign among you. When your children ask in time to come, What do those stones mean to you? You shall tell them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it passed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall be to the people of Israel a memorial forever. <laughs> Consider the first generation. The first generation of Israelites being freed from Egypt, there were the miracles at Egypt, the plagues, right? Big signs, big visible, obvious things that God is doing, right? He split the Red Sea, big, big, obvious thing. He gave them manna. He gave them bread from heaven and fed a nation. And we're talking a couple million people, probably. Hmm. There's a lot of people to feed every day. Manna from heaven. Big signs. There was more. And how often, how often did that first generation not consider what God had already done for them? All that they could consider was how fearful the next thing was. All they could consider was how discomforting the future must be. How difficult things will be for me. They would not consider that God has brought us this far. They would not think back on what God has done for us already. They, did, they, they didn't have a care to remember the work that God had done for them. God commands this next generation, this obedient generation thus far, to take stones from the very place where God did an amazing work to bring them into the holy land, to bring them into the promised land, to take stones as a memorial, to remember back on what God has done for them. What has God done in your life? If you're a believer, what has God done in your life? Are you married? Do you know that your marriage is a memorial to God? It's intact because of Him, not because, not because of you, certainly. It's intact because of Him. Do your children walk in the truth? Do you know that's a memorial to God? They walk in the truth because God has called them. And hopefully you have walked in obedience to that to raise them that way. So consider this for yourself. Take time to pray about this. What are things that you need to think about and remember that God has brought you through? Because I guarantee you that God has given you plenty of reason to trust Him. 
that seems like a pretty shallow way to put it, but I know that he has. <laughs> you know, God is trustworthy, and he does more than he needs to to prove his trustworthiness to us. We need to step into the Jordan and know that he's going to show up, know that he's going to be there. I'm always praying that uh, God's work will, God's word, God's word will do an amazing work in your guys' hearts when you hear this. I'm praying for you guys, and uh, you know that's our that's our lesson for the week. So um, read over it a couple times, and uh, you know really think about those significant things that you see in there. Love you guys. Catch you next time.